Uh, General Singh, as well as the Chief of Sri Lankan Army, thank you very much for letting an airman uh, stand up here in front of all these proud soldiers and discuss uh, what is a very important topic to all of us, both regionally and what I hope to talk about as far as globally. Uh, I'm very blessed in the organization that I lead it in Hawaii, and that we do have a global mission, but I am a direct reporting unit to the Indo-PACOM commander, Admiral Davidson. I would like to say he sends his regards, and if he were here, he would reiterate, as would Secretary of Defense Mattis, his view that the, in the U.S. national defense strategy on the importance of events like this, which enhance partnerships. As mentioned, our center focuses on training, education, research, and civil military coordination across the spectrum of humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. And as you know, militaries across the globe have a role both internally, as was described previously, and in providing aid to others. I am here today to talk about that. To set the stage, this slide basically explains why my organization is in Hawaii and not in Washington, D.C. As you can see, this, the Ring of Fire, which provides about 75% of the seismic activity of the world, covers the vast majority of the, east, the Western Pacific. And you, the magnitude, frequency, and the impacts of extreme events are increasing. The slide also depicts only natural disasters, but humanitarian assistance can be needed across the spectrum of conflict, as evidenced in Syria today, as well as flooding re relief operations in Laos and in India, as are typical in many natural disasters. The Internal Displacement Monitoring Center mentioned earlier in Geneva provided this data, which shows that the effect on people from natural disaster events. This data is far more extreme when displacement from conflict is added. As mentioned earlier, approximately 40 million people are affected by displacement, and the prediction is by the end of 2017, there will be an additional 19 million displaced by natural disasters. And although climate change and coastal flooding are potentially arguable point, which I will not get into, the movement of populations to the coast and the growth in the number of megacities continues. Most projections, as you'll see on the far right-hand side, out to 2020 are illustrative at best. But even if off by a factor of two, this is still a huge economic impact for these hazards as well. Within the Indo-Pacific region, the United Nations has identified what it considers to be the five most likely, most dangerous scenarios. In this case, a 7.2 or better earthquake in Dhaka, West Manila, or Kathmandu directly, a super cyclone in Myanmar, although in discussions with them, they are just as concerned about an earthquake in Mandalay Bay, or an earthquake or super tsunami again in Indonesia. So main point number one, if you want to keep track, is as military planners, these are, not, these are not the only, just the most likely scenarios that you may respond to internally if this is your nation, or you may be asked to assist by providing external aid from your country to help these folks. But what would be needed? In the case of Nepal, trauma care, search and rescue, and rebel removal. Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, flood, death desperately led to the need for food, water, and power. And even in the United States in Hurricane Katrina, we experienced needs for shelter, security, and transportation. But you will not be alone, and it is highly unlikely that you will be there first. There are over 40,000 non-governmental organizations worldwide, and several thousand that have a multinational presence. So as I would like to make now is my main point number two, is that as a military organization, you must be aware that aid agencies will be there for, before you, while you're there, and after you depart. The question I have is, are you prepared to work with them? Are you prepared to work with them in a natural disaster? For that might be easy. But in a conflict, there will be significant challenges. Allow me to give an example from Typhoon Haiyan in 2013. This map shows the presence of the International Federation of the Red Crescent and Red Cross Societies. And a couple of images from now, I'll be showing you one similar for the military response. And although you probably cannot read the words, 17 different Red Cross or Red Crescent societies came to the Philippines and were on the ground providing critical capabilities to the hardest hit areas. So with the stage set 
And two of my main points are already covered. Let's look at the military actors in a disaster or in a crisis. As promised, here's the foreign military presence from Haiyan. Notice, 20 nations contributed to the cause, according to the United Nations, to include dozens of planes, helicopters, as well as two aircraft carriers and the medical ship Peace Ark. And in an ideal world, this is what it would look like at execution. So for main point number three, I want you to remember this, is that the affected state, wherever this disaster occurs, is the center of the event. To the right is the international humanitarian community and all the actors that I discussed earlier. To the left are assisting states and their militaries, of which you potentially could be one. And in the middle are the coordinating processes and mechanisms that are unique in a disaster response. And like any unique endeavor, it also has its own set of global, regional, and even functional rule books. In this case, talk about the Oslo guidelines and the rules with that. They're actually logistics guides, information sharing guides, and if you're a member of the ASEAN community, ASEAN has an entire set of rules associated with the one ASEAN, one response construct for disaster response in the ASEAN regions. I will not go through each of these, but as a military response force, these are the typical capabilities that you, an assisting state, would be asked for. I guess the question would be, and it was alluded to earlier, is can your military do these things? As I discussed on the rules, is can they follow the rules of an HADR event? And then going back even to the very beginning is, do they know how to interact with the humanitarian community? And will they be ready to do that when called upon? It really does look like this. So my final point is that coordination is the key. This chart shows, as a military guy, the military at the top with the government's humanitarian community and stakeholders in the, in, around the edges, but it truly becomes a unity of effort. Are you trained and prepared to do that? Are you ready to respond to the disasters that are going to, to appear either in your country or in your capability to support somebody else? I'll bring up a quick example of a specific U.S. military example, and this has to do with the U.S. engagements across the region as well as some specific events in Nepal. On the bottom right-hand side, start going back as far as 2010, the 3rd Marine Expeditionary Force out of Okinawa as well as U.S. Army Pacific and other forces held a series of events across Nepal. All of this was prior to the big earthquake in 2015, and it was that preparation, readiness, and training that enabled the U.S. military to be able to respond with the capabilities that they brought. However, as noticed on the left-hand part of this slide, the Army, the Nepal Army, after action report, also wanted to point out a few things, is that in this case, because of the location of the, of the, uh, the earthquake, the airport remained intact, which was not part of any of the original plan. Most of the supply routes and communication stayed open, and the disaster could have been far, far worse. The point being is that had the, the military, both in Nepal, as well as international militaries participating across the region, not been able to engage and participate in activities there, they would not have been nearly as prepared as they were when that disaster struck. I'm going to close with this slide just to point out that across the Asia Pacific today or Indo-Pacific today, there are a series of events with international audience participation, hope for, and expectations. These are just three. Basically, Tempest Express looks at the participation of multinational forces in disaster response and other scenarios. The Singaporeans and the Bangladeshis are host, co-hosting an event this April to look at that same function. And then the U.S. has a program called the DREES in which they get engaged with, with nations across the region to try to enhance that. These are each events in which that preparation, that training, and that experience will go a long way in case the, bad, in case the big one or one of the big five ever hits. I am a fast speaker, and I am now complete. I will await your questions. Thank you.